Please be seated. So our readings today are going to start in Genesis and end in Revelation. Um, so the, all the, um, the books that we're in will appear on the screen and I'll try to help you keep up with, with the route that we're taking. So it's a bit unusual. We often have two readings, but today we have more than two, just short readings. So we'll start in Genesis chapter 3 and I'll read verses 21 to 24. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. And now we go to Leviticus chapter 26 and starting at verse 23. In spite of these things, you do not accept my correction but continue to be hostile toward me. I myself will be hostile toward you and, you and will afflict you for your sins seven times over. And I will bring the sword on you to avenge the breaking of the covenant. When you withdraw into your cities, I will send a plague among you and you will be given into enemy hands. When I cut off your supply of bread, ten women will be able to bake your bread in one oven and they will dole out the bread by weight. You will eat but will not be satisfied. And then Deuteronomy chapter 32, beginning at verse 39. See now that I myself am he. There is no God besides me. I put to death and I bring to life. I have wounded and I will heal and no one can deliver out of my hand. I lift my hand to heaven and solemnly swear, as surely as I live forever, when I sharpen my flashing sword and my hand grasps it in judgment, I will take vengeance on my enemies and repay those who hate me. I would make my arrows drunk with blood while my sword devours flesh, the blood of the slain and the captives, the heads of the enemy leaders. Rejoice, you nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants. He will take vengeance on his enemies and make atonement for his land and people. And now Nahum chapter 1. A prophecy concerning Nineveh. The book of the vision of Nahum the Elkishite. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. And now we go to Romans chapter 12. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Now Hebrews chapter 10. For we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. 1 Peter chapter 4 For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household, and if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if, if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, 
what will become of the ungodly and the sinner. And now Revelation chapter 19. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And now in chapter 22, the last reading. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, that's a cheerful group of readings. Um, Zamira, can you just turn the light off, please? Can you turn the lights off? Because the first picture I want to show uh, shows up better when it's dark. Um, is there an Italian in the house this morning? No one from Italy? Good. Well, I can get away with what this is called. This is called chiaroscuro. It's probably not what the Italians call it, but it's a painting which shows deep contrast between darkness and light. This one is Doubting Thomas, when Jesus invites him to put your finger into my side. The next one is by, oh, that first one, by the way, was by Caravaggio. This one is by Nikolai Nikolaevich Gay, a Russian painter. And it shows Jesus on trial before Pilate. And again, there's this deep contrast between the shadows and the light. The next one is from Rembrandt, The Return of the Prodigal Son. It's found in the Hermitage in uh, St. Petersburg. Again, deep darkness, no, go back, go back. Deep darkness and light. See the contrast. Now the next one. The Adoration of the Christ Child by Van Honthorst, a Dutch painter. Do you see how the light is coming out of the baby and lighting up the faces of the children? contrast between darkness and light. And the final one, This is Supper at Emmaus by Rembrandt. Not a famous picture, but it's there. Jesus himself looks to be in the dark, but out of him is shining the light and Cleopas is amazed at what he's hearing. And in the far distance you can see presumably Mrs. Cleopas washing the dishes after supper. 
Well, the lights can go back on. You might be saying to yourself, come on, Neil, get to the text. You're the first person to complain when the preacher doesn't get to the text. Well, all will be revealed. We're halfway through our sermon series on the Minor Prophets. And last week, we looked at the Minor Prophets through the lens of Romans chapter 1, verse 2, where it says the Gospel was promised beforehand in the Prophets. We've seen in Hosea God's faithful love. We've seen in Joel that the Spirit will be poured out on all people. In Amos, seek me and live. What an invitation, a kind invitation. Obadiah, the kingdom is the Lord's. Jonah, where the Lord saves a wicked city and an unrepentant prophet. Micah, where there's a promise that God will bury our sins in the deepest sea. But today, we come to Nahum, a prophecy concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkoshite. We don't know who Elkosh was or where Elkosh was. The prophecy of Nahum, however, is directed against Nineveh. It's the prophecy that Jonah wished had been enacted on Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria, the great northern superpower at the time. Nineveh was powerful and developed. Um, this is a map from Jerusalem to Nineveh. It would take you about 257 hours to walk, apparently, according to Google. It's 1,138 kilometers. It's about half the distance if you were to walk from Bishkek to Delhi. Desert in the way, not mountains. Nineveh was surrounded by water, by rivers and canals and lakes. It was brutal and it was beautiful. It was famous for its violence and its bloodthirstiness. It was a merciless conqueror of anyone who got in its way. It was a master of cruel and unusual punishment. And Nineveh was eventually destroyed by the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar in 612 BC. But how would the people of Nineveh ever hear the word of the Lord? It was over a thousand kilometers to the northeast of Jerusalem. How would they know? that there was the threat of, uh, of destruction. Well, there was a system of envoys and ambassadors and messengers and heralds that went between these various uh, kingdoms. And what was the message of Nahum? Well, chapter 1 is a description of God bringing vengeance on his enemies. And chapters 2 and 3 give the details. In this short, story, uh, short prophecy, there are just a few lines of hope, but not much. It's hard to find the gospel in Nahum. Let me give you some examples. Chariots storming through the streets, plunder the silver, steal the gold. I am against you, roars the Lord. I will burn up your chariots in smoke and the sword will devour your lions. The crack of whips, the clatter of wheels, galloping horses, charging cavalry, flashing swords, glittering spears, many casualties, piles of dead bodies without number, people stumbling over the corpses. It gets worse. I am against you, declares the Lord Almighty. I will pelt you with your own filth. I will treat you with contempt and make you a spectacle. Nineveh is in ruins. Fire will consume you. The sword will cut you down. It will devour you like a swarm of locusts. 
Nothing can heal you. Your wound is fatal. It is a stereotype of the Old Testament God. You might say to yourself, where is the gospel? Nahum says, the Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. The Lord is powerful over the forces of nature. The Lord is irresistible in his anger. The Lord is good to those who trust in him. And you might be saying to yourselves, where's the gospel, Neil? Where's the God who so loved the world? Where's the promise of the Holy Spirit? Where's Jesus dying for our sins? Where's the hope of the resurrection? Where's the promise of heaven? Where is freedom from sin? Where is light and life and liberty? Where, where's adoption into the family of God? Where's the gospel, Neil? Why are you preaching from Nahum? Because it gives us so little hope. Nahum gives us blood and torment, war and savagery, death and judgment. Where's the gospel? Nahum's view of the world and his understanding of God are very dark, bleak, black, threatening. Look at how God is portrayed. Nahum presents God in these terms. Angry, jealous, vengeful. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies. Um, the, the root word here is venge. You have revenge, avenge, vengeance. It's all the same thing. It's to pay back. Let's look at these three emotions, jealousy, vengeance, and anger. Jealousy. Jealousy is what an insecure boyfriend thinks when his girlfriend talks to someone else. Jealousy is a low human emotion, conceived in fear and brought to birth in doubt. How can God be jealous? It's a ridiculous thought. But God's jealousy is a sign of his faithfulness because he will do everything to win back the bride as we saw in Hosea. Vengeance. Vengeance is an Im what embittered humans do. It's the ugly desire to repay insult with injury. There's a whole genre of movies about vengeance and they're all ugly. And it's all around the idea of don't get mad, get even. Well, actually get one back. Vengeance is the pathetic in desire to restore personal honour. I've been offended, I've been insulted. Where's my respect? But God's vengeance is a sign of his justice. He will do anything to rescue his people. Well, what about anger? Why would God be angry? Why do we get angry? We get angry when we're surprised by something unpleasant. But God knows everything, and therefore he can't be surprised. So why does he get angry? Let me give you some examples. Let's say, for example, you had created something magnificent, a quilt, or a meal, or a tapestry, or a painting, or a PhD thesis. Let's take the PhD thesis. You came to my house, I showed you my PhD thesis, and you opened it, and then you took the cigarette out of your mouth and tapped it, so the ash fell on your PhD thesis. 
and you wiped your nose on it and then spat in it, you'd probably be angry. Or what about your children? What if you let them go out to the park and some body did something terrible to one of your children? It would be a natural and loving response to be angry. If you just said, well, yeah, whatever, these things happen, there would be no love for your children. God's anger is a sign of his love. It is a necessary sign of his love. It is a delight in all that he has made. Among the emotions that the scripture uses to describe God, jealousy and anger and vengeance are the hardest to understand. They seem so petty, but God's jealousy is not like human envy. God's anger is not like human rage. God's kindness is not like human generosity. God's vengeance is not as like human wounded pride. No, God's jealousy, anger, love, kindness are unchanging. They are constant. Human emotions come and go with the wind and the mood and the moon and the weather. I wonder what mood you've come in this morning. You'll probably go out in a different mood after this sermon. But we do not know everything. We do not have absolute power. And we are not everywhere. And therefore we may not take vengeance. But God is everywhere, knows everything, is all-powerful, and his judgments are right and good. And that's why I had these readings, thank you Lucy, from all of the scriptures. In Genesis we see that after he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword. There's no way back into the garden. There are angels, the cherubim, and a sword. And we see God's vengeance Im imaged as a sword in the passage from Leviticus as well. I will bring the sword on you to avenge the breaking of the covenant. We see it in Deuteronomy 32. When I sharpen my flashing sword and my hand grasps it in judgment, I will take vengeance on my adversaries and repay those who hate me. And then in Nahum chapter 1, we get the Lord is a jealous and avenging God, full of wrath. And by this stage you're saying, Neil, will you kindly get to the New Testament and the Gospel? Okay. Let's go to Romans. That's a good example of the Gospel, isn't it? Romans 12, 19. Oh no, we're back to vengeance again. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. You may not take revenge, but God alone has that right. Okay, so you found a verse about revenge in the New Testament. Come on, get to the Gospel. Hebrews 10, 30 to 31. For we know him who said, it's mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Because we're not dealing with a God who's a cuddly toy. He's not the almighty, almighty. We cannot domesticate God. He's not safe. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. We need to look more carefully at this idea of God's vengeance because it's written deep into Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. It's often couched in terms of a sword, sometimes a sword in the hand, sometimes, bizarrely, a sword coming out of the mouth. 
when John had his vision on Patmos, the opening chapter, he turned and saw one like a son of man, a robe coming down to his feet, a golden sash, his hair white like wool, his eyes flashing with blazing fire, his feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, his voice was like the sound of many waters, in his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a two-edged sword, and his face was burning like the sun in all its brilliance. You see, vengeance is one of those things that, although we're created in the image of God, we cannot experience or have. It's one of those things that God alone has, and we have no right to perform. You see, we're made in God's image, but there are things we can image and there are things we can't image, and vengeance is one of them. The holding of life and death is in God's hands. Deuteronomy 32, 29, See now, I myself am he, says the Lord. There is no God beside me. I put to death and I bring to life. I have wounded and I will heal and no one can deliver out of my hand. The end of human life is God's prerogative, it's not ours. If you go and buy a mobile phone, if you don't plug it into the mains, the battery runs out and it'll die. And there's no point complaining, oh, Samsung are so mean, you have to keep on plugging this thing into the, back, into the mains. Human beings are no different. We have to be plugged in, connected to the source of life, who is God himself. And if we don't, we will die, just like our mobile phones die when not attached to the source of power. God is the source of life and he's the purpose of life. God gives life and he withdraws life. When the Lord ceases to give me breath, I will go before him and I will have one and only plea that Jesus Christ has died for me. You see, the rider of the donkey who came into Jerusalem is the rider of the white horse. He came in humility to bring salvation. He waits with patience for us to turn to him. But there is a day of judgment coming, for we must all stand before the judgment seat of God. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Every knee will bow before him. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We, we all have a desire that ultimately the wrong things in this world will be put right. We desire that slavery will be abolished and that slave traders will be brought to justice. We desire that land seizures may stop and that the thieves will be brought to account. We desire that wars will cease and warmongers will be punished. Like Jonah, we sit in judgment on the city and we're waiting for fire to fall down from heaven. Like David, we cry out, Oh, that you would slay the wicked! And then we look in the mirror. And then we look within. And we find wickedness. Because we don't do justice. We don't love mercy. And we're not walking humbly with our God. And so as soon as those words are out of David's mouth, Lord, then you would slay the wicked, he's forced to turn and to look within and say, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way 
everlasting. The word of God, the sword of the Spirit, is a two-edged sword. We lift it up and we're just about to use it on someone and we cut ourselves. We pick it up to cut through evil and we are injured by it. It cuts both ways and the sword of the Spirit cuts deeply into those who hold it and those who preach it. O oh Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And so this brings me back to Rembrandt and the supper at Emmaus. In order to paint this picture, Rembrandt has to turn the canvas black. There has to be a black background. He has to put layer upon layer of darkness down. And when the canvas is covered by deep darkness, then he can paint over it with light. At this supper at Emmaus, the disciples were filled with grief because injustice had won. Herod, Pilate, the priests had killed Jesus. They were expecting victory, but saw only weakness. Jesus had failed. There was no hope. They were disappointed, depressed, in the dark. Where was God's unfailing love, Hosea? Where was the promise of God's spirit poured out? Joel, where was the invitation to seek God and live? Amos, where was the kingdom? For the king was dead. Obadiah, where was God's compassion on Nineveh? Where was the son of David born in Bethlehem? Micah, he was dead, he was buried, and all their hopes with him. This was their darkness. For an evil power more mighty than Nineveh had triumphed. But into the darkness, Jesus himself drew near. What are you talking about? Were you the only person who's in Jerusalem who doesn't know what's happened in these days? What's happened? Well, Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, has been killed. Our hopes were in him. And then starting with Moses and the prophets, Jesus showed them how the Messiah had to suffer these things. The Messiah had to absorb the vengeance, the anger, and the jealousy of God. Jesus showed them how the Messiah was to be found in all the scriptures. And Jesus revealed himself to them in the breaking of bread. You see, when everything was blackness, deep depression, and darkness, the risen Lord set their hearts alight. And this is what he does on page one of the Bible and on the last page of the Bible. Into the darkness he calls out, let there be light. And in the city of God there's no need for the sun or the moon, for the Lord is the light of the city and the Lamb. It was at the cross that God's justice was displayed in self-sacrifice. He says, I, will, I made this universe, I will mend it. He is the creator and the redeemer. It was at the cross that God's wrath was satisfied and to bring light that he entered into the darkness. It was at the cross where God's jealousy was satisfied by obedience the crucified Saviour does not call out for vengeance, but for forgiveness. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The crucified Saviour says, it is finished. And then onto this black background, he shined the light 
of the resurrection, the hope of glory, the power of the Spirit, the community of the church, eternal life. See, Christ is in all of the scriptures. The gospel was promised by the prophets in advance. Nahum paints the darkness of God's judgment, which will be worse than anything we can possibly imagine. But God's grace is deeper than we can possibly fathom. This painting of the blackness before the light is exactly what Paul does in the book of Romans. We've just finished a sermon series on Romans. The first three chapters, unremitting bad news, all have sinned, darkened hearts, depraved minds, degraded bodies. God has given them over. It's the bad news of the gospel. And then he starts to paint the good news. The righteousness of God is revealed. We're justified by faith. We're redeemed. We're released. We are grafted into the promises and covenants of Israel. We're adopted into God's family. So, how should we read Nahum? It is the black background of the judgment of God against which the gospel is painted. God's first messenger to Nineveh was Jonah. He went very reluctantly by fish and he came and God saved the city. God's second messenger to Nineveh was Nahum with a judgment. God is slow to anger, great in power, but he will not leave the guilty unpunished. So, living between that offer of salvation and the day of judgment, let us not show contempt for the riches of God's kindness, forbearance and patience, not realising that God's kindness is intended to lead us to repentance. So God's anger is a necessary sign of his love. God's jealousy a necessary sign of his faithfulness. God's vengeance, a necessary sign of his justice. We come before an awesome, pure, holy and righteous God. Let us reach out for his salvation. Amen. Let's pray. Precious God, your word is like a two-edged sword. We need you, Lord God, to apply your sword to our lives. Cut out that which is not from you and preserve that which is from you. Lord, Lead us to repentance, we pray. In Jesus' precious name. Amen.